Welcome to CCM Engineering. Welcome to CCM Shark Tank. My name is Professor Jefferson Reyes Cartano. I'm extremely proud that you are here. I'm even more proud of my engineering students. A round of applause for the engineers once again. All right, thank you so much. So what do we do? What are we? What is this place supposed to be? What is this session supposed to be? It's a capstone project under the guise of Shark Tank. So you will notice that these five teams slash companies will showcase to you their preparation for the past 14, 15 weeks. They will demonstrate research, product solution, all the way down to prototyping, and they will convince all of you to fund them for the next steps. These five groups include Edu Products. Please stand up. All right, I had a round of applause for Edu Products. Another group is Citywide Environmental Solutions. Please stand up. Thank you, Engineer Jim. Thank you, Engineer Kyle. We also have Real Life Engineering. Please stand up, Engineer Brian, Engineer Joe. Thank you so much. We also have M&M Industries, Merckt and Maltz Industries, Engineer Evan, Engineer Ted. We also have Safe House Industries, Engineer Danny, Engineer Addy, Engineer Alex. And I think we have Edu Products as well. We talked about Edu Products. Okay, so thank you again. The theme for this year is competency, compassion, and civic engagement. Last year, it was be the change you want to see in the world. So in the next 20 to 30 minutes, you will, you will witness the following showcase. Engineering design cycle from step one to step eight. You'll also witness a fabulous demonstration. Keep in mind the demonstration or prototype is a proof of concept with the intent and hope of soliciting for your funds for the next step, which is hopefully production. All right. In addition, we have 10 minutes for question and answer. For the question and answer, please consider not just being an investor, be also a potential user, a technical partner, perhaps a contract manufacturer. The feedback that you provide the engineers are extremely important. We went through the entire engineering design cycle from the problems in the world to what the community needs, all the way to possible solutions and testing the solution. But by having investors here, you have your own priorities. If your priority is financial, ask about a financial question. If your priority is technical compatibility with your own product, ask a technical compatibility question. If it's more of durability, ask about it. If it's about safety, ask about it as well. Uh, engineers solve problems, and sometimes the problem we solve is humanitarian, not just bells and whistles. So I will now give the floor to our first company. By the way, I provided them a hundred dollar funding as a non-for-profit Cartano Industries. <laughs> and with that one hundred dollars, they were able to do very, very well. So thank you so much, guys. Our first company is M&M Industries, Merck and Moss Industries. Take it away. childhood education. Um, our office is located at the Empire State Building in New York City. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Sorry. Do we relax? Okay. So our focus is early childhood education. You might ask yourself, what are the issues around this topic? Um, well, early childhood education is one of the most critical periods of development in person's life is when the brain is most malleable. Um, the American education system is largely focused on memorization and regurgitation rather than critical thinking and approaching problems. Usually children between ages three and four have uh, limited access to anything before preschool, so it's good to start early, get them learning before they actually have to go in and experience it for real. So this 
this really presents an opportunity, this early period of childhood, to develop psychological and uh, intellectual growth. Okay. So, development during early childhood is largely a mix of nature and nurture. So it's genetics and environmental stimuli. Um, it's not one or the other necessarily, but a combination of both. Usually with the effective me methods of uh, learning and like hands-on activities, it doesn't matter as much as if you're not like mentally prepared for the topic or whatnot. And usually children who are chal uh, challenged critically are better prepared to face the world rather than just go in immediately and start struggling with how to memorize everything. So here are some statistics regarding childhood education in the United States. 52% of children ages 3 to 4 are not enrolled in any kind of school, no preschool. 8% um, of children 5 to 6 are not enrolled. And out of uh, all 50 states, 40 of them have 50% or less of 4-year-olds enrolled in preschool. So geographically, you might ask yourself, what does that look like? This is it. Yellow, the yellow states are 51% and above. Uh, the gray states are 46 to 50. The light gray are 41 to 45. And the blue are 40% or below. So it's oh. clear in the west coast, it's a lot less enrollment. In school. And this was a huge factor in us choosing to uh, try and improve this area because this is clearly an issue, especially in the west coast. We want to try and get more of an improvement before actually having them go into school and just immediately just bombarded with things that they're not prepared for, especially when there's little to no enrollment in that sort of area. And also, this kind of makes it a broader issue rather than just being about education. It's also about socioeconomic status and geographic location. So, what is already out there? There are federal programs which deal with early childhood education, early childhood care. Um, such as Head Start, and it's, it brings high quality education to kids in poverty. So, and studies show that it works, and that a child's IQ increases significantly while they're in the program. However, as soon as they leave, the child also often regresses. So without that constant being surrounded by other children, being um, in those programs, that usually the, the long-term benefits aren't there clearly a difference, like you, having a one-on-one -on -one and being in a certain like concealed situation with people, like trying to teach them specific things is much different than actually going and attending school and being with other people and everything. So it's like the change in environment severely affects how the child acts in class and affects like, learning. And Additionally, the, trust of, the cost of child care, so daycare or private care like an um, in the United States, it's risen drastically from an average of $84 per week in 1985 to 143 in 2011. And it's probably more than that now. So it's, that's not very financially available for a lot of people. It's, it's quite expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is our goal. Usually, our goal is to affect early childhood opportunity and positive effect of both individuals and the future of society. Uh, in the current state of affairs of childhood education is not in the greatest position, so we'd like to improve it. And we've taken the first step with developing a technology that should assist in the early development of their minds, typically, or in our case, with uh, numbers and numerics. And it will give uh, them a better understanding of what they're dealing with, rather than being pounded with uh, trying to memorize certain things. They'll be able to learn it themselves through like a hands-on experience, making more of an impact on their brains and hopefully steering them in the right direction. And we decided to focus specifically on motor skills and engaging senses, so sight and touch um, are what our prototype is mainly concerned with right now. Um, and according to school psychologist Mary Mert, my mother. <laughs> 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 
data point though. It's a, it's a real data point. We yeah. brought we brought the problem to her and we asked her what would be the most effective means of getting children to like engage more outside of school and a, anything to do with sensory motor skills was her first like as soon as I asked her that was exactly what she said because it's important to get them involved with hands on rather than just constantly trying to get them to memorize things because that won't stick with a child but if you can get them to engage and actually understand what they're doing rather than try and just force it upon them, then it'll stick with them a lot better. So it's laying a foundation rather than just forcing memorization. Exactly. Um, okay. And also keep in mind we're talking about very young children, like ages three to four. So rather than trying to teach them, I don't know, how to read through a technology or something, we focus more on just sensory stimuli. All right, so this is our solution, um, the MM Ed, or the MM Educational Guide. So obviously we can't solve all of the issues about early childhood education in our country, but we've taken the first step by designing a product that could assist young children with numbers and counting. So using sensory outputs, lights, and vibration, um, the child will learn through practice rather than memorization. As we said previously, it is meant for very young kids, so it's obviously not something that you'd have, you'd give to your child who's like already attending preschool or is in like early grade school, because it's the basis of n numbers. So you're going to hand it to a child that is not enrolled in school yet, just to give them like a head start and know what they're doing, rather than handing it to someone who is already familiar and then it's just a fun game. The, our goal is to make it interactive enough and fun for them so that they actually want to use it and develop enough of a like familiarity with it so that they understand what they're doing. So it's a, a gamer toy. Yeah. And um, you can see a 3D rendering of what it would look like put together. Yeah, Today our demo we have um, is half open so you can see what's inside. Our plan would be to close it later on. Um, condense the interior. So how it works. It's an interactive sensory game. Uh, basically, it vibrates at a random number of times, numbers one through nine, and it waits for, it gives the, the kid a prompt to hit a button on a keypad. Um, and it's focused on positive reinforcement, so when they hit the correct number, a little light goes on. Um, and if they don't hit the, the right number, nothing happens. We thought about having it so that it tallied how many got wrong. But again, we're talking about really little kids, so you don't want to discourage them. <laughs> we wanted it to beep, but we also thought that would might have been a little harsh. And yeah, yeah. Like, that like a buzz when you lose. But yeah. instead, it's focused on winning. Um, so there's one set of LEDs at the top, and we'll show this in a minute, that tally how many you got correct as you go through the, the game. There are 10 rounds. Um, and then the, there's another set of LEDs that light and corresponding to those LEDs that make the shape of a smiley face. So, um, a little celebration at the end. Yeah, if, if you get all ten correct, there's a little <laughs> light show. So it's a pretty simple concept. Um, so now we'll, we'll show it to you. This is the interior before uh, it was put into the interior. Engineer Evan, feel free to invite the investors to come closer. If, yeah, if you guys want to see some of the electronics, move to be able to especially the tech investors. Around, yeah. mm -hmm. Because we're kind of limited on wire. It's a very impressive demo, by the way. Um, Evan, you might need to use the mic just in case, uh, yeah, either for you or for next to the buzzer or something. Okay. Alright. I'll just put it over here. Alright, so I'm going to restart the game. So, everyone ready? Yeah. Okay, so it vibrated once, so I'm going to hit one. This is our tally for correct answer. And that was eight times, so I'm going to hit eight. Oh, guys, uh, get around the table so that the video camera can see the demo. Okay. So uh, if you can just crowd Engineer Evan over here in a semicircle. 
Yeah, just crowd. Okay, yeah. everyone just yeah, get just around. Crowd, crowd behind Evan, yeah. No, no, if you can scoot around, because we want proof on camera that it worked. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's what I've seen the front side. We're here. All right. All right. Whatever. So, I'll restart it again. Everyone ready? So, it vibrated five times. I'm going to hit five. Okay, that was six, but before I just noticed that because I got one right already, there's one LED on the bar lit up and one LED on the smiley face. Oh, uh, just the reinforcement? Yep. So that was six. I'm going to hit the wrong thing just to show you that nothing happens. And then when I get to six, another LED lights up. So that was four. That was nine. That was two. Perfectly. That was nine. Seven. Seven again. By this time, the kid is getting excited. Oh, right? Seven. All right, so I won the game. So, some little celebration. Nine. Nine. And then it stays like that. And uh, that's it. So it's a truly random number each time. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is in a second. Terrific. Impressive demo, Engineer Evan. Engineer Ted, impressive Thanks. demo. Hopefully the investors feel the same. And I believe they do. Another round of applause for that. So this is our bill of material. Um, we kind of tallied up how much everything that cost it to build the thing uh, ended up being around $50. But we're kind of under the assumption that if we went into mass production, we would buy at wholesale prices, probably for a pretty steep price cut. And it would probably cost around $20 to build the thing. And this is just temporary prices. Like we are looking into cheaper, more effective pieces of material. It's not set in stone, it's just for the prototype. And um, this is our function block diagram, so kind of the process of what I was talking about before with the game. Um, you'll notice here it says, you know, we'll have a 9 volt battery instead. Um, we'll probably try to move toward making it a portable device rather than having a kid plug it into the wall socket. Um, <laughs> probably would be a great idea. Yeah, and other things we're thinking about are, you know, choking hazards and things like that. So, how does it work? It's controlled and powered by an Arduino Mega 2560, which is a microcontroller. So, what a microcontroller does is it uses software to control all the hardware around it. So, all the LEDs and the keypad are hooked up to the Arduino, and the Arduino is really like the control center. Um, so, our, pro our, our product is largely soft software based. Um, we wrote the code from scratch in C. Um, and then all the hardware is just the vibration motor, the LEDs, and the keypad. And then also a special thanks to Eric for helping us 3D print the model here at CCM. So this is the code, what it looks like. Um, so there's something called a library, which is, so Arduino is open source, which means that people all over the world can add and uh, modify different scripts which enable devices to work with the chip. So for us to use the keypad with the Arduino, we had to install a library. So it kind of defines how the keypad will interact with the chip. Um, other things about your code, um, you need to define all the pin modes. So whether they're outputs or inputs, that's what all of this is here. Um, and you also need to define integers and variables that you're going to use throughout the process. For example, we have, and there's different data types in C++, and you can't compare different kinds of data types, so you have to convert them as you go through the program, which you'll also see. Um, but for example, this year, I'm making an integer called LED front, and we're defining it as 50. So then every time I type LED front, it really means 50. So rather than 
you know, looking at every single pin with a different number, I can say LED front and the thing that I want to talk about. Um, so this is in the script where the random number is generated. Um, and one thing that's interesting is it's actually a random number because how Arduino generates random numbers, it'll take an analog input on the chip. So analog is physical, real world. Digital is computer. Um, so it takes an analog pin on the chip and uses environmental noise to come up with a random seed for a number. And then you use this command, random 1 through 10, to give us a number 1 through 9 to vibrate the motor that many times. Okay. Um, this is more of the code. All of that on the right is the little light show at the end. So you can see how it says digital right and then a pin number, and then lower or high. So it means it's turning the lights on and off. Um, all the delays are in milliseconds. So you'll see it says delay, and then in parentheses, like 2,000, that's two seconds. Um, okay, so this is, this is our schematic that we drew up. It basically it highlights the inputs and the outputs. We have the keypad up in the top left, and the pins that it incorporates onto the Arduino. Then we have the motor on the top right, labeled circle with the M, and all of its inputs. Uh, all of the resistors are 22K ohms, except for the three on the bottom, which are the ground for the ground. And the, uh, the LEDs that are the smiley face that come around are all on the right side. And then the bar LED, which is the counter for the uh, correct answers, is on the left side. And part of the reason we're showing you this is so that if someone else wanted to go and you know, make this, there would be a reference, um, you know, there's a paper trail of what we did to build our product. Okay, so this is the design for the enclosure. We made it in SketchUp. And everything ended up being like a little too small, so I had to kind of drill some holes and dribble. Um, this is the process of putting it together. And again, ideally, we would want to close the top, but because of all the wires, it'd be kind of difficult. So if we were going into production, we'd probably want to produce a printed circuit board, which would just be a computer chip that had all of these things hooked up to them rather than a ton of wires. We need your funding. For much of what your funding would go to developing and making this more of a like practical technology. Like you said, we'd rather have a printed circuit board because as it stands, if we try to close it, it won't really fit together properly, so we'd like to improve that. We'd, also, we'd like to cut down on costs a little bit just to improve and make it more like affordable for lower income families and have them able to even get their children to, in order, learn more. And then we'd like to improve and make more complex things. So we were initially also going to add uh, visual and uh, hearing for the senses because we wanted it to buzz and then they count how many buzzes and do the same thing and put on the keypad and then we we're going to have like a big LED that would blink and however so many times it blinks. But as it stands now we don't have that but we'd mu very much like to incorporate that in so that we have more than just one sense and we get to be able to get them familiar with multiple things rather than just holding something that vibrates. Even just having a more complex game what we would probably try to develop. Um, we would also hire experts, conduct studies, such as psychologists and social workers to study how kids interact with the toy and uh, see if it's effective. So this is our work site, some of the work to use. Um, special thanks to Professor Cartano, our fearless leader. Uh, Professor Edward Ossolinik is not here today, but he introduced me to coding in this coding class. Um, and then again, Eric, thank you for 3D printing, and thank you guys for coming today. Thank you. So. Thank you. so we're going to have a Q&A now, if you want to ask us any questions. Thank you, Evan Industries. If you can just take a seat. It's my better to have a seat. We have business cards from Engineer Evan, Engineer Ted. Um, for those folks who missed the demo towards the end of our session around 545, the team will be willing to do another demo of MMEG, MM Educational Guide. I encourage you to ask questions 
And everybody has a copy of the judge's sheet and the judge's rubric. So please scale them, grade them based on what you've witnessed. I highly encourage you to be very positive though. All right, any questions? Any questions? All right, now, in Investor Andrea. Awesome idea, I think that's so cool that you're trying to get into it. Um, I just had a question with, in regards to your code, you mentioned environmental noise. How do you, um, can you elaborate more on that, what that, how it interacts with your own? So, there's an open analog input chip, or a pin on the chip, and it's because of the line of code there, the Arduino knows to use that as the seed for generating the random number. And environmental noise could be elect it's like electrical signals in the air. They're all around us, the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, radio waves, whatever. So I was just wondering if the environmental noise is going to be interesting that helps the No, it's just to generate a random number. Okay. We were, for noise, we were going more for like a, a, like a buzzer or something that sounded nice for the child so that they wouldn't hear. That's... Yeah, that's numbers. what we plan on doing in the future yeah, so that um, they can do the same thing just with sound rather than vibration. A very good question, though, just from a usability standpoint. The kid might be distracted. Is it a buzzer from the system or is it yeah. from the noise? So, great question. Um, investor from Quinnipiac in Connecticut. Yes. Um, uh, my question is, like, what's the stop? Like, um, for my experience, like a two or three year old that just like, hit the thing a bunch of times. What's the stop? Like, what's the yeah. yeah, durability would be part of our research and development phase. So we were thinking about that because obviously we're handing this to young children, so we're going to want to make yeah. it durable enough. And it really couldn't go in this condition because everything's open, it's wires. Yeah. The enclosure is going to be a lot more durable in the future, and we're going to try and obviously make the interior less prone to falling apart. If so they security is definitely a concern. And more questions. We have ten minutes of questions and answers. Investor. Oh yeah, I'll go. Um, you what would stop a child from brute forcing the answer? There's no way to stop them from inputting a wrong answer. They could just go one through nine, seven times, and complete the puzzle. Kind of takes the fun out of the game, though, doesn't it? Yes, but as someone sure. who's very lazy, I might find that fun. And well, not solve the problem we, at all. we can't but force the user to do anything. True, but is there any like way to stop them from? Well, that would have, would have been the, the impetus to have the wrong tally and then the negative aspect of it. But we decided to bypass that entirely. We'll incorporate at some point something that at, like displays to them that they did not get the answer correctly. We yeah. just our current assumption was that we had access to harsh sounding buzzers and a little too like it would just wouldn't work out for them. But we will have something that will display like, hey, you didn't get this right. You got to retry and it. And maybe if we designed a product for older children, that would be a better idea. There's certainly many aspects to it, right? There could be an emotional kid, mm -hmm. a hyperactive kid as well. So again, that's part of your research. That's yeah. why we are soliciting their funding. But big question. Uh, investor Jenny sure. Randolph. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious what your pricing options are. Mm -hmm. If you guys want to like move this out as like a do education tool to bypass pre-K and all that stuff, mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your plan to get this out to the home in a portable way that would be, you know, like sexy? To so some of the distributors we were thinking of going through might have been Amazon or um, toy stores, not Toys R Us anymore, obviously, Somewhere but um, in the maybe Best Buy electronic stores or um, boutique stores like Sharper Image or places like that. Um, in terms of pricing, we're trying to keep it as affordable as possible. So maybe in the neighborhood of $40, $50. We're going to go primarily with online distribution because it's the thing nowadays. So. Would, would you consider teaming up with some sort of like school to provide these as a learning tool? Perhaps, Absolutely. yeah. Um, we sat down with the Department of Education and talked out a contract. See how they use it. We don't want them to. But yeah, absolutely. Doing that with something that would make it a lot easier to distribute and have out to people. Uh, three more questions on the other end of the spectrum, i.e. users. Parents with children, three-year-old, four-year-old. Investor Roscoff? Sure. Is, has, have you guys given any thought to whether there's any expansive capability? Could this have an add-on module, or as my child gets older, they can play a different kind of game, maybe adding or multiplication game, and still have the same effect? That was initially actually what we were going to go with. We were going to make it simple math, and but we were 
we turned closer towards younger children, but that was it's definitely on our mind. That's something that we'd like to do and just have incorporate different types of mathematic formulas. Perhaps a business card for in, for sure. Mr. Roscoe yes. oh, so, for so another uh, meeting. Uh, 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 I'll actually have one. Like okay. okay. You have one already. Okay. okay. Uh, but as a follow-up investment question, does the product, as it stands, does it have any capability for an add-on module or to be reprogrammed? It could be reprogrammed. It's reprogrammed for Absolutely. sure. Yeah. Um, but I think what you said about making it modular is an interesting idea. Maybe mechanically having like another thing snap onto it that does something else. Like it, like an attachment to make it more complicated yeah. or an additional thing. Thank you. And even the Arduino, if it's based on the app itself, you can actually remove some of the peripherals and Absolutely. make it more compact. Make it even smarter. It's pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Investor does it. Yeah, but um, the problem with that, I mean, this is kind of a personal opinion. I see a lot of kids on tablets and restaurants, and I don't know. There's so many distractions that you have when you have a device with that much capability. They can go on the internet. They can go on. I don't know. Not, little kids don't have Facebook, but maybe their parents' Facebook. Who knows? All kinds of notifications pop up. It's a sensory overload. We're also trying to go with affordability, so they'd have to, and then purchase the tablet and then get the app on the tablet. So having this being already more affordable than a tablet itself to then purchase an app, we thought that would be a better, for lesser, like less income, it would just and be easier to purchase. There's something a little more endearing about having a physical toy exactly. that exists in the real world that, than an app. And also just to comment also, you guys mentioned about doing further research on the psychology of the kids yeah. as well. And for all we know, the shape, the size, the form factor will encourage them to use it. Investor McCabe? Uh, I actually have two questions. But the one, just to be clear, do you, do you want this not to be wireless? You don't want this to connect to the outside world? Is that what you're trying to say? You mean to the internet? Yeah. As of now, not really. Not really. Okay. And just the mechanics of it. I mean, obviously, the keypad. Do you think of any other interface devices? Um, maybe in the future, if we had more advanced capabilities, um, touch screen, something like that. We we'll maybe have a display for the outputs rather than having solely LEDs as the only output. Two more questions, and certainly at the end of the event, you can ask the engineers more questions or uh, do a non-disclosure and meet somewhere and uh, talk more about the <laughs> things. <laughs> Two more questions. Uh, investor in Andrea. Exactly what you just said. So building familiarity with numbers. Rather than, like, when they go to class and they're trying to learn and they're consistently being required to memorize everything and try and familiarize themselves by just watching someone do it on the board and trying to get them to read certain things, we'd rather have them hands-on so that they get more in tune with it and, and are able to And looking to the themselves. future, we might want to make other games that further develop that kind of logic, so lay a foundation for thinking rather than just giving you know, information. One final question. We're doing well with time, by the way. One final question. Perspective, safety, you have a kid. Okay, a big round of applause for m and &M Industries. Thank you guys. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. All right. Yeah. Impressive. Great demo, by the way. I highly encourage you to stay towards the end to get another demo of MMEG MMEG. Thank you so much. Our next group is Real Life Engineering with their Smart Campus Solution. Very relevant in today's society. We have Engineer Joe, Engineer Brian. Take it away. The floor is yours. CFO and the CSO of the Real Life Engineering School. Right. So the project we're introducing to you guys today is Smart Campus. We're going to go more into it, but that's just the general name that we're trying to push off to people today. 
So our motto is integrating engineering principles and diagnostics to solve current contentions. So what, our, what we're trying to do is with the knowledge that we currently have and what we currently possess is to take engineering principles and fundamentals and apply them to attack problems that appear to kind of face a lot of people in today's life, especially what you've been seeing on the news recently, unfortunately. Uh, currently we're located in Austin, Texas. Now the cool thing about Austin, Texas is as it is one of the leading um, cities for startup companies to kind of get, you know, get their, get their uh, businesses going. So that's the next slide. Alright, so our problem is safety. Sa mostly safety during on a campus. So there's like, on an open campus like this, anyone can just show up and just park their car and just walk in almost any building in any room. So what we're trying to push is to try to eliminate that factor by filtering the people's access to certain rooms, especially so like a visitor that is not even listed at all on the campus records, uh, make it so that the students are safe and also the faculty. All right, so our solution. Well, the solution that we came through on just doing some research was introducing a biometric scanner, so a fingerprint scanner that will just, when you first uh, enroll into the campus and actually start attending, you just get your fingerprint along with your ID just into the system. That then you can use that like at every door just to be able to scan your fingerprint and it will unlock the door until I let you go in. Um, so, yeah. And then I know with bi uh, biometrics and fingerprints, everyone's like, okay, now they have my fingerprint, they know who I am, they're going to track me or whatever. But I'm going to go more into that down the line when I'm explaining the physical design and physical okay. uh, program of the actual fingerprint. But that'll be a couple slides uh, ahead. So, what we plan to do, like I said, we will be taking, uh, creating some sort of console that will be mounted by each door, possibly even the console that will just be like in the student center that it to access other information. Uh, but it would be there to also, could be used for like uh, faculty when it comes to a professor teaching a class. It could tell them who scanned their finger to get into the room um, as well. So just help with attendance and increase the efficiency of class, class time. So this is a picture of what the fingerprint scanner looks like. We have a demo for you guys to see, but that'll be later down the line. And then this is just the dimensions of the actual fingerprint scanner. So it's not going to be this huge device that's going to be blocking the doors, but it's going to be more of like a like a doorbell, I guess, would be a better analogy for it. And this is our function block diagram. So this goes into like the hardware and uh, database layout. So it's going to be a hardwired system within the campus. Which can be powered by the solar system, the uh, solar system that we have here. The uh, sorry, not solar. The uh, solar power that we have here at the campus, or the wind turbine, like we have over there. Um, so it goes into the database. So with Titan that they're starting to push out now in Web Advisor, each student's looked up, uh, each student's signed up to a section number. So with that section number, only a certain student. Only a student with that section number for a certain room can access this, access that room. Um, further into looking into the diagram, you have the physical scanner. It's a low voltage system. Doesn't require too much power. It's security level three. So that's basing it off that there's five levels of security. So with security level three, you're having a less than one percent um, rate of it being a misread. And you also have it where it's going to scan your fingerprint. It's going to take your fingerprint, make it into a template. So it's not actually holding the fingerprint itself. It's going to change it into a template. Then within the scanner itself, it takes that template, reads your different ridges and different lines of your fingerprint, translates it into a, um, a binary code. So it's not holding that, uh, that physical fingerprint. It's actually just kind of translating it into a, bi a binary code. It'll then be scanned through it one ever uh, another user scans it. Also, another thing is that when it comes to like the locking from rooms, it won't lock you out of the room unless the class is going on. So you'd be able to access like a lab room if you need to be there for like um, to work on some lab or a project 
that may not be during normal class hours. But as long as it, there's no other class going on. And then we have the Arduino, which is the actual computer behind it. But with the fingerprint scanner, there's kind of two computers, because the fingerprint scanner is its own separate system. So what it does, like I was saying earlier, has a computer on it that does the algorithms, and does the translations into the physical template, into the binary code, which is then fed into the Arduino, and then it's scanned through the system, through the enrollment fingerprints that are already part of it. And then today we have the, uh, with the demo, we have just a couple LEDs kind of showing the passability and the accessibility of it. But later down the line, we're hoping to actually have a physical LED display. So how this could be implemented? So not um, only could we just, at least if we would have it at each door, prevent people that, strangers, for, because also there are school shootings. We don't want, it helps prevent that. Um, as well as, what it could be implemented even in dorm life. You have it that a visitor, like a guest, that's going to be staying in your room if you're in a dorm. All they would have to do is just log in, they're saying that they're your guest and they have their fingerprints so they don't have to worry about you having to be in the dorm to get to enter it. So they also then have access for however long they plan on staying, but as a visitor. Um, as well as even for um, faculty, like for some of the adjuncts that are work here, they'd have to, if the door is locked that they have to go into, they'd have to obviously get someone to unlock it for them. This would also bypass that and just, it would let, unlock the door for them as well. Uh, I know we focused on a lot of uh, more of the campus side of the school side, since that's where we're presented today. I mean, this system can, is really universal. You can put it into a company, you can put it into any other campus-like uh, place to kind of keep this security and this kind of filter for, uh, for whatever need is. And then right. we have our company collaboration, which I'm not going to touch too much on what their product is because I don't want to ruin their presentation. But their company is Smart House Industries, and they have a smart lock that they're trying to implement into the into the system and into how homes and businesses. And we're trying to we've been talking with them and we've been working with them to kind of have the fingerprint sensor tied into their system as well. So future possibilities, like I said, we'd integrate into data so that you can actually access like your school profile on like WebAdvisor immediately as well. And it'll just give you all the information you need. Um, possibly even help update WebAdvisor so it's a little uh, more user friendly. Like having a, a schedule that actually shows your, the entire week in so sort of blocks as well. Um, also incorporate into like small or large companies. So just as if there's Google, they have us a lot of like security um, that they just prevent certain people from going to different locations because of how um, top secret some of their stuff is. And then even like apartment access, like just also incorporated so you don't always have to have a key on you. You can just have a, um, a fingerprint scanner that can also let you into the door. Um, and then now we have the demonstration. So for those investors or anyone else interested, that would like to come up and see how the system works and come up right over here. So, this is our Arduino. Yeah. Just scoot over a little bit and let's just make sure the video camera can see the demo. So right now, let's say Brian wants to come. He's, in a, he's trying to access the classroom that he's not part of or he's not registered in. So he scans his fingerprint to the yeah. door. So it's right here. And, and you can see the, the scanner did blink, scan this. but nothing happened. Yeah, the standby light is still on. So let's say I'm a student that wanted to access the room, and I'm part of that so much. So much. Yeah, I scan my fingerprint. That green LED will switch. Just think about that. Yeah. So my that. I'm enrolled within that class, and it'll switch on. So let's say, with the smart house industries, there they have the lock. So when I when that green LED switches over to green, that lock would turn, or that room would open. So that that's this is more like the foundation of how it's working. But there's a lot more to it that 
with funding and future possibilities, we'd like to uh, we'd like to definitely explore. Um, and that's and that's that's. Do that's you want to do it. another demo? Yeah, 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 for yeah, those, yeah. Let's do another demo. Yeah. So right now, it's Fantastic. in standby mode. It's waiting for a fingerprint yeah. scan. So Brian's not part of the classroom. He scans his fingerprint, yeah. and it's it's going to stay locked. That's what that white light is going to represent. And let's say I'm part of that classroom, and I scan my finger. It switches over. So then you have an unlock. I'm part of that room. I'm part of that classroom. I can get into that classroom. And that that's really what that is. And, so, and CTO Joe, and that could trigger many things. Oh, this yeah. It's not just, that it's could just trigger database. this LED is yeah. just to show you how it would switch over. But I mean, with the lock, with a bunch of other things, with attendance, with a database, I mean, the, the possibilities with this in regards to security and efficiency, they're, they're uh, virtually, you know, endless. Yeah. Does the door open up when it passes? Uh, no, it'd be more of a manual lock would unlock and then you would open the door. Okay. Fantastic. I'm sure that demo will capitalize, stimulate more questions later yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. So. And then we have our Q&A now. If there's any questions, comments, concerns that you'd like to go over, Professor Frontes, Have Investor a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. Well, uh, well, uh, you, mentioned this, uh, you mentioned the intrusion on someone's personal information of course. being out there. Of course. Uh, now, it's being turned into being turned into a particular format. Is there mm -hmm. basically encryption in there? Yeah, yeah. The uh, physical fingerprint scanner has an encryptor and algorithm within it that when it scans the fingerprint, it, cha it translates into a PNG file and then a black and white template. And then each fingerprint has a, has a ridge, has a bump, has an endpoint. And that algorithm and the uh, and that system within the fingerprint sensor picks up on those points and converts it into a binary code. So, like I was saying earlier, the actual physical fingerprint isn't being kept within a system. It's more of the binary uh, translation that will be tracked back to the fingerprint when it is scanned. I was going to say one other thing. I yeah. think you guys have a really good idea here. Another thing from a faculty yeah, perspective. Yeah, of course. I would know everybody in the class is who they say they are when they take the exam. Yeah. And then the online version. Yeah, yeah. If somebody taking an online, online test exam. That's the only way that would. Yeah, I mean, fingerprint. Right. I mean, if you want to go into the James Bond kind of right. things, you can scan. You can, you know, put powder on fingerprints or you, or whatever. But I mean, a fingerprint's a fingerprint at the end of the day. If you wanted to use like an RFID chip, I could use someone's card. I could take someone's card, scan it, and. I mean, you'd think I was that person, but with a fingerprint, that's who you are. There's no, there's no, you know, discrepancy with that. So I think that's really where the, that's, that's really, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Authenticity. Yeah. 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 Ye
that he, they are a threat. Yeah. And so then in so regards to the whole explosives thing, I mean, that's a very extreme, I think, uh, situation that I don't think at the moment anyone could really kind of try to tackle or prevent. Because, I mean, explosives are explosives at the end of the day. I don't know if you want to put you know, explosive proof doors on a campus or something, but that that's something else. Um, yeah. We're trying to focus more on individual classrooms also. Because yeah. right, from a target market standpoint, right, I mean, certainly the authenticity, the integrity of the education process, like Professor Fuentes said, or Investor Fuentes said, that's definitely top priority for them. Mm -hmm. I think from a safety standpoint, I think it's an evolving thing. It's a deeply, it's, it's a deep discussion that then needs, needs yeah, to be uh, further. assessed. Or, or, you know, it might be just a deterrent, and that's a big yeah, positive yeah, exactly. uh, move forward. Investor from Connecticut. Um, uh, so, if everyone's going to be put on the thing, then eventually it's going to be a spread of some sickness. Is there a good point. Well, for some of that, it would be just like um, a daily just cleaning off the um, the console. Because there are the, like some janitors that will go around cleaning up the rooms. Like you can just wipe it down and just disinfect it uh, without. All right, and then the second question. Yep. If someone were to say get a cup on their thumb, how would that get Like, because in some classes, you know, in chemistry, you might make burners. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, there, there's also like this um, scanner is is a little limited in terms of memory, but when it comes to a big database, you'd be able to at least scan one, maybe two fingers, maybe all ten if you really wanted to, to have like to prevent that. It would just be like your choice when um, given the option if you want to scan one or all ten. Like a backup fingerprint, yeah. I guess you could say. Yeah. Backup. Maybe yeah. you can integrate a camera, right? Like, mm -hmm. Good. I think the intent is there. We certainly lots more discussion. Smart campus yeah. requires more funding. Investor Ross companies. Yep. Yeah. Is this a system? Would this have to be a system-wide implementation, or can this be an yeah. aftermarket, so to speak? Can this be retrofitted in the current building, or does this have to be from the ground up, from the inception? Of the I think it would definitely be able yeah. to be uh, implemented post post construction of a building. I don't think there would be any limitation in regards to that. Um, the only thing that it would be it would be to have a database set up, but that's further down the line. That's further funding, further research that we're uh, hoping to kind of tackle and use with everyone's uh, time and, and such. But it's definitely something that could be put into a building following its at previous, you know, previous standing. Yeah, it's, I think it's one of the initiatives, one of the products that, that could really benefit from policy. Yeah. Right? And there's some type of education policy, some type of law enforcement policy. Mm -hmm. You guys can sell like hotcakes, right? You'll be part of any deployment. Right? Yeah, for sure. Let's see. Um, professional, maybe? Is that what you said? So, if I'm with a fail power, so say like the building goes out of power. Yeah. Then all the doors are unlocked. Yeah. That's a very good point. That's um, I think with the doors, they'll be manually locked. It's just that the fingerprint itself will then be an automatic version of it. So let's say the system goes down, that door will still be locked. So no one can get in class. But I mean, obviously you have a key too, that's a backup, is a, is a key, yeah. For like janitors and such. This is just, uh, it's meant mostly to increase efficiency, because like when it comes to an adjunct, if they, they don't usually carry keys to the classroom. And if the door is locked that they have to teach in, they'd have to find someone else that can unlock the door for them. Um, it would just be, that is just a workaround to that situation, um, which that's, situation is still viable for when there's no power. Uh, there are many Silicon Valley uh, campuses, yeah. i.e. companies that have biometric infrastructure. Oh, yeah. yeah, so I mean, yeah. we take a book out of their pages and, and look into how they have them implemented. That's right. That's right. Just, how does the sensor work? Is it, is it taking a photo of your phone? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what it does is that it scans the fingerprint. They'll take and make, uh, it'll make a template of the fingerprint itself, like a black and white template. It's photographic, it's not pressure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's photographic. Okay, so if I take a, a scan of your finger, I can stick on the end of my finger right there. Um, that's possible. I'm not 100% sure on that. We haven't tested it, but it'll definitely be something that we'd have to attack within further research and, and development. Right. Unless it has it's temperature sensing reasons. also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not an answer. Uh, that's not a question I can answer right now. But when, I would say that when it comes to even like looking at the code, it says it's waiting for a finger, a fingerprint. So I think. Um, it probably does have sort of some sort of sense 
pressure sensor to know when there's a finger on there. Um, then it will start trying to take the um, take a picture. Because okay. also, if it's just a yeah, yeah. it's just a like a slip of paper, it probably would know that there's some there's uh, no pressure on it. Yeah, like at the certain spots, and see that the picture does not line up. Like the bridges don't really match what it probably would think it should be as well. Yeah. Terrific question, especially the workflow type of questions and hacking the system type of questions yeah, and yeah. big questions. Yeah. Andre, um, you mentioned you're using binary encryption. Yeah. I would just consider looking into SHA 256 encryption. It's a lot more secure. Okay. Also, um, for the, the piece, is it plastic that you're using? Or yeah, currently it is. I mean, definitely further. Have you like, looked into like, materials that are? Because like, my concern is when someone puts their the finger on, you can extract that. You could, like you said, use pieces like, of oh, scotch tape. tape. Okay. So maybe there's a material that you could use that wouldn't actually um, keep the finger there. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. I know, I know what you're saying. Yeah, that's definitely something we'd look into. Uh, looking th down the road and maybe far down the mm -hmm. road. Could this be used for your front door or a car door? Yeah, exactly. That's actually what the uh, integration with uh, Safe House Industries, which they'll talk about their product when they come up to present to you, and they'll they'll talk about it more. But it's definitely a possibility that would be looked into and implemented. That's right. And the computer science aspect of, from Investor Andrea's standpoint is very important from a database and yeah, security for sure. standpoint. Because that's that's the knowledge yeah. that we lack, unfortunately. Um, we're more of the hardware side of it. So having your knowledge and having Funding from a computer science point of view would actually be very helpful. Yes. Uh, investor Alex, do you think that the device could be implemented into a starter car? Um, we haven't looked into that, but I mean, I couldn't see why not. Yeah, it, it would be able, like, have we have it, it? Just it will input a um, or output a, a high signal saying that it accepted that fingerprint. So it would just be the same thing for a car, just that you have safety. It's like the same thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's yeah. just that it has a different way to and only start activate. people can start it if they're registered to that vehicle. Oh, that's a very good uh, look of that. Yeah. yeah. We can still accommodate three more questions. Three more questions. In terms of cost, you guys said you wanted to put a fingerprint scanner on every door. Yeah, yeah. What um, would that run like an institution like this, which probably has hundreds, if not thousands? Oh, that's so a very good point. So, a question right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, the cost for um, getting all the parts was about. Fifty dollars, and that was just for one unit each. When it comes when it comes to like a wholesale, it'll probably go down to maybe um, thirty dollars per unit, mm -hmm. um, and then it would just be that and an install like possibly an installation fee, but it shouldn't be more than like thirty dollars a unit. Yeah, but I mean, also looking at it being a campus and being a security uh, security system, for lack of a better word. You have grants. You have government grants to kind of back that up. So that's definitely something that we yeah. take advantage of. Um, just to piggyback off that question, yeah. you said it would cost the, you, it would cost you guys to cost How much would you quote the city institution? What, what were your profit margins? Or so your goal profit margins there? When it came to like just the installation, all would probably just be upwards of. It really depends on the amount of units and the the hour. So it could just be. Out, the amount of hours it takes to install it, or just a set rate, um, or thing that if it was going to be, if it was just a set rate for say an entire campus, maybe a thousand. But we really weren't thinking more towards that because we just wanted to make it too um, expensive as well. I was, was going to say this is an excellent point yeah. to say they're engineers. Yeah, we don't, we don't worry about the uh, finances behind it in this building. That's why, why we work together exactly. in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly, yeah. you just found the, 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 the engineer is going to say, I'll, I'll build it to you for free. I just get to yeah. play with it. For sure, right. yeah, exactly. It sounds like Larry Peter, sir, you've been hiring Eric Schmidt. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not at Google. I still want to question, engineer, investor mark. Investor mark. I have a question. What makes you guys have other biometric security? Um, well, can't really say too much different, but it also like there is a sometimes it's just the availability in your your area, um, as well as just sometimes just bring down the cost of what it is to install it on the campus as well. It's just 
and, and also with our system, I mean, I know we've been focusing a lot on security, but because that's kind of like the forefront of where we're standing in the world today, security and, and uh, such as that. But also with that, with the system that we're trying to push out, we haven't been able to show that because of lack of funding. But being able to have a fingerprint be tied to a student that could then access their Titan or their um, web advisor or have this whole database system tied to a school in the school database. That kind of, you know, separates us, you know what I mean? I got you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Good. One last question. From others, from other commercial <laughs> perspective, quality perspective. Investor Andrea. Um, the databases that will be storing the information about fingerprints, will you be um, Storing that at your company headquarters, or will you be supplying the servers for the, the schools? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the schools would be the only ones able to access those fingerprints. It wouldn't be a off-campus yeah, type of thing. Are you going to supply the school the right equipment to keep track of all the data? Yeah. 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 For sure. Or do you keep it? Yeah. Or we also be able to just integrate to integrate to the, the current system yeah, server current that they system. have. Yeah. To keep make sure it's not. All, all closed in and not um, a accessible from the outside. Uh, uh, um, investor Rita, of course. Final question, Investor Rita. The legal aspect of requiring to Yeah, yeah. Um, so there definitely would be an opt-out option for students. You can't force them to to submit their biometric data to the school. But I mean, if you look at the process of when we're enrolling a new student to a campus, they're sitting down, they're taking a picture of their face, they're giving the school all their information. And I mean, a fingerprint, looking at all that, I don't really see, personally, I don't see it being that big of a difference, especially since the school's not holding the actual physical uh, fingerprint. It's just a binary number. Well, yeah. I'm sure a lawyer would no, for sure. I mean, yeah. I mean that's what but they do, right? They, they give you our time. Consulting like, lawyers, the social, yeah. like, yeah. schools sometimes they want your social security number, which is a bit more um, concerning to give away than just a fingerprint. So that's like, because that's is proof that you exist compared to just a fingerprint, just saying that this is um, this is just associated to me and me alone. But someone could steal that. Um, the social security number, no one can really steal your fingerprint um, unless they uh, yeah, I mean, do that. With that yeah. Which we're going to have to further yeah. look into. But they can't really steal it and keep it forever. It's really. Yeah. Still so do, yeah. doing very well yeah. with time. A round of applause for Relax Engineers. Again, guys, especially for the investors who were here the past couple of years, you probably noticed that the discussions, the Q&A, has been quite in-depth, and there's a reason why. They spent 14 weeks in the research and development of the solution. Part of the research and development is really to identify civic community-related problems that are important to you. They don't just come to you and come up with the, with the next generation PlayStation 4. They're coming up with solutions that capture, address the needs of the community and the civic engagement. All right, our next group is Safe House Industries. You notice the Real Life Engineering mentioned Safe House Industries. I think you'll be impressed with their smart door, smart lock. Take it away. All right, well, we are Safe House Industries. I'm the CEO, Alexander Lanier. Dan Lindano, I'm the CFO. And I'm Addison Lefrec, I'm the CTO. So we had a little bit of trouble in the beginning trying to figure out what problem we wanted to do. We steered more towards the security, but uh, more towards the home aspect. And we really got into researching burglaries and different other uh, problems associated with it. So, uh, ideally, once we get more into the product, this is we want a big factory uh, to be able to build our product out of. Um, this, is, this one happens to be in Michigan. There's just a ton of abandoned factories in Michigan that are generally kind of cheap. It was a huge place to be able to produce things, and now not so much. So it would be nice to be able to get something like that. Um. Oh, I just want to mention that all the production we make for our product 
will be made at our own uh, headquarters. And uh, I have a question for everybody in the audience. Uh, has anybody ever been or like gone through a robbery, theft at their own house? Or any family members, anybody they know? You know we got a couple. It's not something. Not something. Wish that's for anybody else, right? Certainly not. Yeah. Uh, um, what triggered our idea was I have a friend uh, in the town of Parsippany. Uh, back in around January, his um, his house got uh, like property got stolen. And that's what triggered our idea. Um, here's some facts about uh, robberies all over the nation. Just um, scary high numbers. This is just from 2016 where we pulled this info. Um, and it's just alarming. Yeah, uh, so about like 327,000 robberies occur nationwide. Just in the United States alone, that's not counting the entire world, which I'm sure is in the millions. Um, the total value stolen per property was estimated to be about $12 billion just in the year 2016 alone. And the average dollars stolen of properties per, per household is about 1100 bucks, And that's a lot of money. I'm sure nobody would want. Not to mention any of the valuables that might be family heirlooms and things like that. Sentimental things that you just can't get rid of. And out of all the crimes in 2015, 40% of them were robberies, which is a really high percentage. Here's some pictures of some robberies. Get you in the right mindset. <laughs> of what can happen. <laughs> um, these are some cities with the highest robberies in the United States. Um, this just goes to show that uh, it's all over the nation. It's not just like certain triggered areas. And it doesn't matter if it's rural areas, city areas, your, your chances for burglary are still there. Um, Different well, terrible things that can happen when things like this happen. Yeah, when properties aren't uh, secured safely, uh, it can lead to other crimes such as rape, human trafficking, uh, murder, and these are way worse crimes. Uh, well, home alone <laughs> humor, perfect example of home alone not being secure safely. All right, and so according to an unknown FBI agent, this is a quote by him that goes, of course crime can strike anywhere, so even if you're in a city with the lowest burglary rates in America, you should know that you and your home are never immune to crimes, and it's always safe to plan how you can protect your home and family. So you can always take steps further to be able to, you know, increase your family's safety and make sure that no one has access to your home. So, so we had an idea. Um, originally, we were able to build a rock that people, um, and then it was kind of a bit more door itself can integrate, you know, this biometric scanner, you have cameras on it, uh, you can have uh, automatic locks, you can walk up your car and it'll automatically unlock sensing the in your pocket. So, if you have an idea of something we actually think that we can do, we have to integrate the technology and the It can be broken down into windows, all hooked up in your security system, um, and even like dog and that's a terrible thing to be able to have because um, people can, you know, if you have a big dog, a person can squeeze through that dog. So it's kind of a concern now. We'd ask, you know, if you put a monitor on the collar of the dog, they'd be able to walk through the door and it would unlock the big dog. And it secures that area. Even against pests like raccoons, cats, and anything else you wouldn't want inside your house, you could be, uh, be safer against that. One little type of what we plan to put on the door, but we just didn't have enough time to be able to build a full door and get all of that research done. So, 
the way we've done this is we use the Raspberry Pi, because Raspberry Pi is built in Wi-Fi functionality. So we wanted to be able to demonstrate the usability of the door lock with our cell phone. So we found an app that can communicate with the Raspberry Pi and program the Raspberry Pi so that when you press unlock on the phone, it unlocks the door. And doing that is using a servo motor attached to the two internal housing and a for lack of better terms, a door lock scan. Um, and it will mount directly onto your door. And it will scan your bed door. And it will So I can demonstrate that. So anybody would like to take a look at it? Yeah, I'll do the button. Now keep in mind, this whole piece would have to be mounted onto a full door in order to get it to work. And uh, if you want to, we'd have to have text for that. I'll spin it right now. Angle it tells the camera. Tells the camera. All right, so I'm just hitting the button. I'm going to make sure it's spinning the right way. It's nice. It's spinning. All right. So if you want to press that button, you can unlock the door. You can auto unlock and lock the door. That's from the app to the cloud to the motor. To the so this would be one of the first functions you could have on the door. And the best part about the idea would be that you'd be able to customize the door to be able to have anything that you want to do. So if you wanted to have a little bit more security, you want to be able to have a camera under something on your phone, you could get that. You can get your fingerprint scanner if you want to. You would have the choice of how much security you would want. That would come into your doctor on how much it costs to build it, because in front doors are made out of different things. So if you want to get wood, they're all cost and now it's if you want a different types of metals, anything that you might actually want in your door, you would have to be able to go onto our website and custom order and be able to have these installed. So our idea is that we might be able to partner with so, He's hooking it up so, with a oh, fingerprint scanner. So yeah, we, we, want to, we want to be able to show you guys how this could be able to integrate yeah. into different things. We also have the fingerprint uh, sensor hooked up to it. We're going to sell so, so. Yeah, this was another demo, guys, with integration from Real Life Engineering. Yeah, yeah. This is how we teamed up with Real Life Engineering. You guys would like to see how that fingerprint scanner actually unlocks a lot. Eventually, we would like to be able to incorporate this into security companies and have them actually be able to install it using our products to so places like uh, ABT and whatnot. When they actually go in and secure all these families' homes, that they'd be able to go in and give their customers what they actually want to be able to secure their family, more than just the log system. Test this, it yeah, doesn't have their fingerprint on. So it will not there you go. open the lock. That's right. And now, engineer, I think can you do it again? Using your finger again. Okay. A little bit more proof that theirs works. 
and it changes things up a little bit. Alright, so as well as for our safe lock, um, the main reason was safety, but with the safety also, uh, this is helpful for handicapped people who are like, say you're upstairs and you're home alone, and somebody's at the door and you just want to open the door for them, you can just open it from your phone, um, you don't have to go all the way downstairs. As well as if you're just like watching a movie in your bedroom and you don't feel like going up, down, getting downstairs, you just open it from your phone. Uh, so it has a lot of different uses. Of course, if you're paranoid and you want to check your, every time you go on a road trip, you need to check to see if the door is unlocked. Okay. Some pictures. Picture. That's actually how it would be hooked up. We'd have to actually mount it onto the door, and it could be interfaced with your current deadbolt locks if that's what you wanted to do, and just buy the base product. But again, our goal would be to have an entire smart door so that we could sell the door and make it out of our plant in Michigan. And like I said, you could go online, just like if you were designing a car online, which I'm sure plenty of people have done. You can go in and pick which features you wanted, and we'd be able to custom build it based on what your family needs and have them all hooked up to your house system. Oh uh, yeah, people want uh, peace of mind at their own homes, uh, especially when they're away from home. They want to make sure their houses are safe. And with burglaries occurring every 13 seconds, this would be something that every house should have. Yeah, with just like the click of a button, you can open it and lock it. So we're pretty much focusing on our customer service here. We, like I said, we could just sell the safe lock and you could sell that through Amazon, Walmart, all those things. Um, but the real goal would be partnering up with security companies and be able to get these doors shipped out, to be able to incorporate them completely into their uh, systems and even getting down the line, maybe future, uh, so you could automatically open your windows. So you know it's gonna be hot when you get home. You don't wanna waste money on your AC. Um, you'd be able to do that from your phone and be able to, you know, actually get some airflow in the house, you know, depending on what you actually need. This is the bill of materials. Um, this is what it costs to make uh, the prototype that we have for just the safe lock. Like I said before, um, when we actually build the full door, it's going to change based on what you want the door made out of, different types of woods and metals that you have for that the different types of technologies that we implement into it, maybe a camera or that fingerprint sensor, um, you know, the wireless uh, entry, to be able to automatically unlock the door when you get close enough. Um, it, it would all change depending on what technology we actually have incorporated. Ideally with the final production, uh, we would want not to go with the Raspberry Pi and then we would want to go with the microcontroller on that printed Board to yeah, external memory to be able to save all that stuff. And like I said, you know, we're going on future plans. Uh, the lock can, can be sold on Walmart, Amazon, and you know, we want to get, but we really want to get partnered up with these companies, these tech companies, our um, security companies. Or more the future products. There are a couple of our collaborations. Of course, everybody's not put on here, all the professors that we have encountered throughout the year. But um, special shout out to Teresa Gary for making all our posters and our business cards. Um, Eric Pedersen, thank you for the 3D printing. And um, Joseph Sapio and Brian Marshalls with our uh, fingerprint scanner. And of course, Professor Carlton. We're all good for the QA. Fantastic Safe House industry. I'm sure our guest list has tons and tons of questions, right? Let me take the first question. Engineer, uh, investor, can set up. Right. So, what, like I was saying before, it really depends on what technologies you want into this. Um, more with working with computer science, you know, engineers and whatnot we'd be able to figure out better apps and customize one for ourselves. I'm sure that's a possible integration. Yes. 
the actual app interface. How does it work exactly? You can go on the app and you make an account on it, or do you just connect to a Wi Fi signal that you identify the actual device? So, so the way the wor it works right now with this model is that Raspberry Pi is connected to Wi Fi <laughs> via Ethernet port. This is to prevent Wi Fi hacking and all that. Uh, make it a little bit more secure. And then your phone uh, can be connected to any form of internet, a Wi-Fi signal, your data connection, and it can connect to the, the Raspberry Pi through an app that we haven't designed one yet, but we found one that connects and can communicate to a Raspberry Pi. So no matter where you are, you can be on the other side of the U.S. As long as that has internet and you have internet, you can unlock your door. So the information is saved Yes. Yep. It has its own storage unit. Yeah. <clears throat> Every different phone has a different um, token, like a different code. So it would be different for every phone. Before I hold the next question, I have a comment also. Can you spend a little bit more time, because we might have um, electromechanical experts in the house, physics experts in the house, on how you selected the fourth servo? I'm going to take that one. Engineer Andy. So what well, we want to have uh, a higher torque servo so we can actually spin the deadbolt. Um, ideally, we want to go with one a little bit more powerful. Uh, during testing, we did find that it did have some difficulty uh, turning it sometimes, but that'd be something we'd have to work on in the future. But for our testing, we found that this one worked very well. Okay, so like, I noticed the casing. You guys put it over the lock. It's like the casing's there, so like the guy can't like reach your window and just unlock it. I think that's a smart design choice, but let's say like the Wi-Fi in the house goes out and you just stop working and you can't access the thing. Is there a way to like essentially fail safe the door and like get the locking mechanism fixed? Yeah. Or, or are you just dead in the water? Like, well, the, the uh, other side of the deadbolt is still accessed through the key. If so you could still manually turn. I'll show okay. you here. Uh, on the housing, there's actually a spot <laughs> to put a, a button in right here. Okay. So you put a button in and it will spin the deadbolt for you. More questions on the workflow, usability, safety, um, the safety aspect of that. Uh, so you would have to connect your phone to your device. Say I get a new phone and I have to connect that new phone to that device. Um, what security measures are there to prevent any phone from being connected to So the way it is now, you have to go into the code of the device and change it. Okay, you have to add your phone. Yes. Right. So that, that's more in the app development that we need to go further into um, to be able to access that and be able to incorporate everybody in your home. So that's future development. Thank you. So right now the way it is, the, the password is the phone itself. The phone um, has a specific token which is inserted into the code. And so the, the token's like 27 characters long. It could be A through F and 0 through 9. Is that like on the hardware level? That's the thing like for every phone? Or is it something like that? It's, it's based on, it's on the software. The app generates it for you for every yeah. different phone. So like I said, that is generated off the app that we're currently using. But ideally, eventually, we'd like to be able to get into a username and password situation. So that way, if something happens, you can still access your home. Yeah, well, uh, it's definitely a security uh, concern. It, it definitely is a little bit of a concern there. It's more we're going to have to do research into. Um. Before we call um, Investor Lucky, um, any questions from the new guests? New guests, any questions? All right, Investor Lucky.
But even even on that topic, um, since we've been sitting down and discussing this, we could implement that fingerprint scanner that a lot of smartphones now have on them to be able to keep you from pocket dialing, to be able to keep a former employee from being able to get the code, because then you would need your code and your fingerprint to be able to get in. So, I mean, if things could be changed down the road. Uh, any other questions? Professor? Right, and I mean, that, that could be changed depending on the person that's ordering the door. So, I mean, we, we could custom build the door to be able to, you know, if you're concerned about that and um, those functions, we could eliminate them and keep them to be um, some different functions in the door and keep the smartphone app off of it. It's definitely a possibility. I'm a professional protection industry, I'm a philanthropist now. Oh, okay. <laughs> what's, what's your philosophy? That means we lost our funding? <laughs> your $100 is gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a philanthropist, um, question, what's your philosophy on centralized smart door unlock a lock? What's your philosophy on that? Will you allow for that in the future? If there's, you know, like a big retailer that says, I want to sell 20, 30 of this entire campus. What's your philosophy on centralized lock and unlock? You're talking, you're talking about just um, selling it to a retailer so they could sell it like they wanted to towards campuses and whatnot? From a, from a university, from a user standpoint, what's your philosophy on automatically locking doors for the entire campus or unlocking it for the entire campus? I mean, it's definitely possible, and I would fully support it if the, if the person actually ordering the door would want it. You know, like I said, the best part about it would be a customized security system for your house. You know, even further than what we have because at, at this point most people just have you know if the magnets in your windows or your door open the cops are getting called which is great but I would rather just them have a harder time getting in the first place. But that's specifically a different aspect of what we're doing essentially that's a, a deeper question about would you allow someone the authority to centralize the lock up? Yeah. More questions. More questions. Yes. Mechanically speaking, not electronically, is there anything that prevents just the normal lock from being open the traditional way by either lock picking it or breaking the lock open directly and just bypassing all of the electronics? I actually don't think it will allow the turning with the uh, with the servo attached to it. Like if someone tried to pick the lock while it was working, even if they were able to pick the pins in the lock, it would turn out. Right, because right now the servo is actually casing it. Um, so it's in, in order to get it off, right, in order to get it off, you need to hit the button on the other side of it in order to free range the servo. But good question. So you're saying it would be impossible to uh, manually the lock um, Yeah, at this time, yeah. Um, See, yeah, no, that was definitely a concern that we've had and kind of tossing around the idea about it. Um, clearly, if the power goes out and you want to be able to get into your house, you do want some kind of uh, way to get in. So we would, we would have to go into further prototyping to be able to figure out how we're going to do that because, again, pick, uh, picking the lock is still a concern. Right, so other, other aspects of the door, once this you know, is at, um, you know, done, we'd be able to have fingerprint scanners, or we would have other means of opening the door besides just the app. All right. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, what happens on the house? I would hook it up straight to the house's power source, I mean, you know, just hardwire it straight into the house. So other applications, it definitely would be interest us um, if we could find uh, partners to be able to team up with that would definitely be something we could see down in the future
Any other questions? How about questions relating to trials, failures? Uh, Addy mentioned a little bit about the pork servo not opening. Oh, yeah, the first servo we had was way too small. It was a micro <laughs> server, and it just wouldn't turn it at all. So it does have to be like a higher power uh, servo. That was uh, one of the failures. And any learning curve with Raspberry Pi, as we told it that? The Raspberry Pi was actually pretty easy. It's a lot easier to code in than the Arduino. Um, it, it, we didn't have many errors in our code there, to be honest. So there was, um, from Real Life Engineering, they have a template that they used that they have from Adafruit, and we just took a code that I designed um, for the Arduino and injected it into the section where it would light up an LED for there. Any other questions? Uh, just one, any question about a potential consumer purchase at Home Depot? Did you buy something at the smart Randolph, comment on it? Uh, how much, from a price standpoint, what would be reasonable to do as a consumer? I mean, as a consumer, I stole a for a ballpark $200. I don't look at doors that much. If you can find a door for $200, even a plain wood door, you are really getting a deal. <laughs> so I think in terms of that, you really have to look into owning a home and how much everything costs in it. They cost a lot of money. I'm going to be frank with you guys. I think your products are just excellent. Oh, well, I appreciate it. I, I, I doubt that From a consumer side, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just the fact that it's open source and we work with so much stuff. It's just I think that that's a good thing to you know, work with. It's got so much like, room for error once you open it up for like, so many devices to you know, work with. I appreciate it. Did you have any more comments there? Yeah, there's no problem. All right, so as I was touched on that a few times. Um, to actually build the whole door is really just kind of in concept. The door itself? Or just the lock? Okay, so if we were just going to sell that product, the safe lock on Amazon, I think it cost us like um, $40 to build like this. We can condense that hopefully into a microcontroller with a little bit more time. And we, sh we should probably be able to sell it around $40, $50 to be able to attach it onto your door. It's a lot cheaper to use a, a microchip than the Raspberry Pi. So if we're going to go into like mass production, the microchip would be like the way to go. And that, th that's when we're going to solve that. Yeah, Very round of applause Thank you so much. And it was wonderful that, that there's integration between real life engineering as well as safe house industries. Our fourth group, second to the last group, is Edu Products. Once again, it's on the education space, similar to m and Industries, but on a different aspect. I think you will find it very impressive as well. Take it away, Engineer Brian. And your Danny and your Sean. Yep. We have a remote. Team Edge of Products. Run the wrong button, huh? Here we go. Edge of Products, where innovation meets education. Based out of Philadelphia, PA, Sunflower Drive. Great location. 
because so the reason why we chose Philadelphia is because it's really close to the UN base of operations, which is over in New York City. So and also it's surrounded by a bunch of uh, schools. It's really close to a school, so we'll be able to like, get, we'll be able to access a lot of education over there. Wow, here's our team. <laughs> Brian McGrath. Uh, business manager. I'm the business manager. Tom Q. Myself. Design engineer. <laughs> and Daniel Orozco. Uh, electrical engineer. Now, here's our mission statement. Through the power of technology, our team plans to make an affordable and quality education for anyone. And uh, nobody should be left behind purely based off of where he or she grows up. And there are no end all solutions. to the people around me, you realize the differences in everyone, and your ignorance is just dwindles. Violence is, is purely just, you know, you, <laughs> peace. If you're smart, you like, you like peace. It, it brings everyone together, and it brings unity and further progress.
then here you have the primary areas in which there is a lack of education. Okay, so there's uh, there's 1.4 billion students on this earth, and 65 million educators globally. Which you know, usually a teacher, you know, is responsible for about 30 students, right? Do the math; it doesn't really add up. Yeah. Being preventing quality education. So warfare is a really big problem where like if there's wars going on in the area there tends to be a lot of a lot of not very good access to education, kinda of like in the Middle East right now, how there's a lot of bombings going on, there really isn't much access to the education around there because all the buildings a large majority of buildings are getting destroyed. And generals, if you look if you look at the gender roles between each country, there's a tends to be a, a huge disparity between males getting a, a higher access to education and a better quality of education. Whereas if, uh, if you look at the females, they tend to not get too much. Discouraged. Yeah. Well, the big one is untrained teachers. Undertrained teachers. A lot of these countries really do not have a uh, very good um, training. So we kind of really want to address that in, with, the, uh, with the part that we're going to present to you. And of course, not the people that are brought up here. It's not going to be done. Donating money to spend school supplies, school estates, and programs that fall short of providing less for less privilege. Dedicating a life of teaching to low income areas. Attempt direct attention to teachers worldwide to teach in these low income areas by trying to get them to teach there. Or assure that teachers are fully equipped to be teaching. It seems a little far fetched, but problems are up. So, a lot of the problems that come up, well, there really tends to not really be many cheap options to actually uh, tackle this problem. Whereas, you, like to donate money, you end up having to donate a lot of money to, uh, to schools to try and come up with solutions. And that, oh, the schools that take this, take this money and put it into something that doesn't really help the education, like how, how some schools would be like setting up security programs, or, or like they just set cameras everywhere, but they don't actually use those to, like these donations are meant to help with uh, education instead of security. Another problem you can also see, um, if I actually get a teacher to go over to um, any of these third world countries, it actually costs a very large amount. Um, I'm looking correctly, but it, sometimes it costs like 15000 just, just to get them over there and um, give them the supplies they need to actually do with this. And also because of the fact that they have such a large student body in each one of their classes, it makes it even harder on them. Yeah, exactly. Money's the primary thing that prevents education. So, it's a big problem. But, uh, what could be done? That's a solution. What could be done? What could be done? Yeah. I wonder about the answer. So, we ask ourselves, based off Professor Cartano's beautiful engineering design process, we got really familiar with this semester. First, you want to ask and identify the need and constraints. You want to research the problem. We have heavy research throughout this semester. Imagine, you've got to develop possible solutions. Plan, and select prom a promising solution. Create, test and evaluate, and then you want to improve upon your design even after it's created. Put your product, presents to you, the edge box. Here's our prototype. We've got it 3D printed in the shop across the street. We'd like to thank um, Edward Voigt. He's not here today, but he helped us with the design. It's <laughs> another angle of our prototype. And um, some, of the, some of the process. Here's Edward here helping us with the design. And here's being 3D printed. Now, I guess we could show you what we're working with. Can we please get closer? It's right next to the book panel. It's over there. 
Are you impressed that you got the box and the electronics there? So if that if that if that um, the op amp the amplifier was not on there, then it would just be a very very low signal. You would you'd have to put your ear out to it. And yes, sure, it's scratchy, but generally um, amplifier circuits have a lot more complex circuitry, and they'll be able to filter out noise and everything like that. And here's our here's our case.
using virtual biology, we can do some more interactive questioning and deep dive with the technical later on. Um, please continue on, uh, especially on the details of the innovation, particularly the workflow of that role play. If it's a next gen Alexa, uh, spend some time on how they get educated. Okay, so what he means by uh, next gen Alexa is that not only would it have the input and output type of uh, program where it would, you would ask it a question and it would just be waiting there, waiting for that question, and then it would spit out an output, you know, the answer that you're looking for. It also has what's called an active mode, where it could project an image onto a board anywhere, no TV screen required, and you'd get a full lesson plan. Now, that would, that would of course help because you don't need the TV screen, it just cuts down on cost even more. Now here is our function block diagram it's called, where it just shows all of the details within how the, our EduCloud would work. Now, it's all connected to our EduCloud, which is the which is the um, the connection of all the information online and everything, and it's interfa interface with the other EduBoxes edu globally. And our um, and our prototype example, the command and data handling center would be the microcomputer, either the Raspberry Pi or Educado. And you see, we need an activation switch, USB port for inputs and outputs, a microphone, which is listening to you, battery, power supply, and uh, projector and speaker. And this is all creating heat, so it needs to be cooled down by fan.
if you were to really like immerse yourself in a virtual reality experience, it would just it would just bring it it would just bring it out to a whole other level. Like let's go to 1700s Paris right now, and you just you put on the goggles and you're there. You know, kids would really be into it. You know, so. Uh, Now, uh, the virtual reality market is primarily ran by video games. And I was thinking, like, wow, uh, this little pot down here is the education sector. That's it. So why not expand it? Why not use this technology to the best possible advantage? Special thanks, Professor Cartano leading the way in this whole process. Eric Peterson, are you still here? He is not. Well, he is, uh, he, he runs the Mech Tech shop, or works at the Mech Tech shop, and he, uh, he helps with the 3D printing process and everything. Uh, Andrew just said, she, uh, she bought us an SD card and helped us out with the, uh, the Raspberry Pi. Um, Edward Boyd, who we mentioned previously, he helped us out with, um, with designing the box itself. Uh, Professor Rosalini helped us out with coding. So, this funky guy. Uh, fellow, fellow classmates, friends, and family. Questions? Comments? Big round of applause. Thank you, Edu Products. Uh, before we begin the question and answer, as you can see with Edu Products, particularly on the Edu Box, it's a grandiose vision, it's an ecosystem. It's a vision for next generation learning. So questions about the technical aspects from off amp standpoint, projector standpoint, or even better questions about future deployment of a system like this, a network of next gen edu boxes with an edu plan, bidding system, edu cloud. It's it's a big ecosystem of it's almost like Apple iTunes as well as um, iPods and so I think it's I think I'm, I'm very impressed from the vision standpoint. Investor questions? Investor Alex, please. So for getting it out there, what we were planning on doing, since we were already so close to the UN by being based in Philadelphia, we would be able to try and get the word out by going to them, and since they're already all around the world, we could try and use them as leverage to... Yeah, we would be trying to work with them in some way. Of course, trying to incorporate it into a budget, like, you know, how MacBooks and everything are such a big thing in schools now. Just incorporate into their budget rather than just being a private investment. Yeah. Um, I love the idea. Actually, um, we were thinking more like USBs, having USBs have preloaded um, actual lessons on them, mm -hmm. to be able to send, just send them to our well, the people who want to buy who buy them. They buy this lesson, and then they just have to connect it in, and then they'd be able to see it. This one can I mean the edu box is really it can target a lot of different ages. We were looking at like maybe. Um, first grade to like sixth, sixth grade, that type of range. Like mostly, mostly um, elementary school we're looking at. Basic education is what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah. And it could also target adults because as you can see in the graphs that were shown, a lot, there's a large number of illiterate adults. So this could definitely help with uh, literate adults mm -hmm. teaching them how to read, write, that sort of thing. Because it's visual instead of uh, trying to read a book they can't they already can't do that so they have to learn somehow yeah yes 
Yes. And then, Investor Kyle. Yeah. Hi, you might have already went over this, but I might have missed it. So, if, just wondering, once you begin your manufacturing, is that when you set plans for distribution? Or? Our distribution, what we're looking at is like Amazon, um, pairing with Amazon, Staples, actually, us individually selling it to uh, different companies as well, as well as schools. So, I, I imagine you guys are something that would be brought up by, probably by the school, they would probably dictate what went on in the program. And, um, yeah, if it was a preset of information, they would have to go over it. You know, I'm sure they go over the textbook that they ordered. You know, that would probably not even be on our part, you know? Okay. Yeah. So, so, like, basically, it's up to, like, the government to, like, how they run this device and yeah. the respect of them. Exactly. It's not exactly. something that's lost internationally. If no. they control what goes in the it goes through them before it goes into the schools. I expect they didn't like what the changes that we made to it, and they're gonna go in and do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And you must likely have a cross section of other role players, right? From psychologists to experts right. in government, and of course. Experts. And and to, to add to it, it's not limited to history, or it would be it would be math. It's just a tool for the teacher to just give them a good experience, good learning experience, rather than just like writing a chalkboard. It would, it would probably last about two hours. Since it has a projector, it, it takes a lot of wattage, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't last all too long. But that would be like a portable model, and we have, we would have it plugged into a power supply for primary means. Any comments about analogies to existing systems? Like, you know, the microphone, the comments about that? So, so what we had in mind was we would have, uh, we would try and use keywords that were said in the sentence asked and just try it, kind of like how uh, YouTube has a system as what it thinks is the most likely video that you're going to want if you type in like uh, capital of the United States, it's going to come up with Washington, will, will some, any video on Washington the most like uh, viewed video, I guess, the most relevant video. We would try and use something like YouTube almost. Yes. Yes. Okay, also does it somehow track or the user's knowledge level and provide suggestions for if the subjects or lessons recommendations for the user based on that was an excellent question. I would put down our insight. We haven't even thought of that. Yeah, we didn't get yeah, that far. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, how Netflix started. Maybe there's kind of like a, a library of edge cloud type of courses that are approved. Kind of like how MOOCs started in the United States. Yeah. And then you have to use the Having them look to see which ones, well, which ones are not 
it would not be approved by our yeah. actual product. Software is a primary means of filtering, but, you know, a, a dedicated team to it to, you know, make sure that uh, there's not that going on, you know. <laughs> A um, couple more questions for from the technical side. Oh, yes. for act, what does that so I was okay. thinking about marketing distribution. Oh, I'm saying, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with one computer per child. We were selling one, one computer to children here in the United States, and then we <coughs> send it one to a third world country. Oh, one for one deal. Yeah. Okay. Have you thought about getting together with M&M's M &M box? So if they buy one here, and then you guys can Excellent idea. We'll have to consult with them after. But I mean, it's an interesting idea because if you ever look at the one computer, they had to deal with things like no internet. So they came up with an interesting way of kind of solving it. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of solutions to use that as a global initiative. Any other questions, especially on the technical side, you know, especially on this, for example. I'm fascinated by the projector. I'm interacting with something and boom, I see my hero, Michael Jackson, Prince. All right, so again, any questions about, you know, the device? The cloud, there's tons of questions about the cloud, is the cloud access to what, you know, um, education course, there's a lot there. Yes. So. Oh, yes. Now, we, it would be a tool for which teachers use to excel their, their teaching, but if, say, a teacher wouldn't be available someday or substitute, you know, like that, um, then a teacher could, like, be, e either that teacher could be in, like, the hospital, like, saying, like, you know, here I am and everything, or another teacher takes place, like, like a virtual substitute teacher. We do plan on this being more like an assistant to the teacher instead of actually trying to replace the teacher. Mm -hmm. Bob, I'm going to attempt to ask a technical question. Uh, one problem I find that projectors have is that like, they're either too far away from the screen or angle. It's such a thing that they're all blurry. And then yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the scope of the camera that you plan on using? That's, uh, you know, like, so the projector doesn't kind of come out with an all blurry and keep it at a correct distance away from the screen. I would say I would have to have an optical zoom in focus so that I can be you know, placed in not really an exact spot. And then you could and then you could still still view it. And then you had to put on the same or something like that. Is there like something that you can explore that would be a bigger object or something? Yes, yes, absolutely. We're looking for that. Computer scientists? Um, is there a class producer that I mean pre installed software? Are you gonna have this? To have um, to have a preset uh, set of information, I would say having a lot of storage would be nice because the video could just be displayed and it wouldn't use, especially for our base model because it's not Wi-Fi enabled. Mean, you would have you would have a preset uh, thing of video on it and. Um, more storage would be key. Uh, well, we have to come up with a the storage capacity for it. But uh, it's not it's not hard to get something like 160 gigabytes. Now, so. but too pricey. Wouldn't even be too pricey. So one one or two final questions, maybe perhaps more on the education ecosystem, perhaps on the bidding system for. Uh, teaching resources, ecosystem questions, and new box. Hardware level. Hardware level. Questions? Did you have any uh, failures where you had to, uh, you know, put a design that didn't work and that you think you come back and uh, yes, we did. We did have a. Oh, 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 oh boy. We did have some failures where we were trying to come up with an amplifier for the speaker. It, a lot of the circuits that we were looking for didn't like. They had some really high values for uh, 
capacitors that we that we didn't actually have available to us. So we kept on trying to find circuits that would work for us, but a lot of the circuits we couldn't actually get to work. So we had to consult one of our uh, professors to help us build the circuit, come up with a good design. Mm. All right. Any other questions for Edu products with Edu Box and the cloud and the ecosystem? All right, big round of applause for Andrew Price. Thank you so much. Great job, great job. Once again, um, to our new guest, welcome to CCM Engineering Shark Tank ELT 213 Capstone Project. Uh, last but not least, we have Citywide Environmental Solutions. For the new guests who came in, feel free to sit down, get some food. Um, everybody should have a copy of the judges sheets. If you care to comment about our students' presentations, once again, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the new, to the new guests. We have Citywide Environmental Solutions, and I think you will love their Fest X solution. about uh, one minute if you can scoot back to your seats that'll be fantastic bring some food all right Citywide Environmental Solutions with the Best X Solution.
said, we're citywide environmental solutions, and our mission statement is to raise awareness and promote change for environmentally safer and cleaner Earth. Okay, this is probably common knowledge by now. Uh, I guess we'll answer questions at the end, and when you come up here, there's this wire over here. Okay, a few acronyms we're going to use during the presentation. Uh, our company, CES, RF, radio frequency, uh, U.S. ultrasonic. Now, ultrasonic is going to be above human hearing, which is about 20 kilohertz, all the way up to about 8. MCU, microcontroller unit, IC, integrated circuit, NYC, New York City, and NDA, non-disclosure agreement. Okay, this is our credentials with a little embellishment. <coughs> and we're a subsidiary of Cartano Industries. And I'm Kyle Wagner, I'm the uh, Chief Technical Officer. Okay, and this is a kind of the structure of our unit, <laughs> of our company, <laughs> as you can see at the top here. This is a CEO of Cartano, of Cartano Industries. <laughs> Below him, this would be James O'Brien, CEO, and I'm somewhere down here. <laughs> no, you're next to me over there. Now, any real leader knows that it's, it's the men and women on the bottom that make the company as a whole look good or bad. And uh, one of the values that we like to instill in our employees is, picture the hand as, as five employees, all right? Separate, they're weak and distant, but when they come together as one, that's a team with force and you can accomplish much more. Okay, um, I'm gonna go through our journey. Our initial mission was to research the garbage problem in major cities around the world and how it affects the environment and related concerns. And from there, we started focusing on cities, and we did some research on New York City and the uh, garbage accumulation. And these are just some statistics of what we found. 14 million tons of waste per year, uh, and at one time, 80% of New York City waste was dumped into the ocean, and I'm sure a lot still is. Uh, okay, this is another statistic. Uh, garbage trucks killed seven people while attempting to keep up with the endless waste, waste removal. Another thing, complaints were up 80% in the last uh, uh, five years. The cost is going crazy. There's, um, I think it's 10 million more than last year from 45 to 55 million. And, you know, people have looked into this and we found other research they did on um, Roosevelt Island. There's a pneumatic system to get rid of garbage to eliminate garbage trucks and such. That seems to work, but it's overly expensive. Uh, okay, another thing we found was that not only does it stink, especially in the summer, but several unwanted guests have moved in, <laughs> like rodents, rats, mice, and that makes a health concern and makes the problem worse. Okay, and this is, you can see a, a rat stealing a slice of pizza out of the subway, and he likes New York pizza. Uh, okay, what, what does this mean to us? Uh, the only, right now, the only reliable means for this problem is pesticides, chemicals, insecticides, and it, that's not good for people and the um, environment. So we don't think that's a good solution to this. So our solution is the C, the citywide environmental solution pest nets. And we need investors, because we've only come so far with a, a prototype right now. Okay, the, this is an overview of what the specific device can do. It's an ultrasonic pest repellent device. It emits varying frequency sounds that is inaudible to humans, but intolerable to a, a lot of pests such as rats, mice, and even insects, and it depends on the frequency of the device. And we're gonna have two modes. If there's an infestation, it will stay on continuously, and we're gonna have a proximity sensor when it, it senses some of these uh, animals. It's a low power device right now. We're running on a nine volt battery. And again, it's chemically free and cruelty free. 
So that's our, our basic selling point. And it's compact and portable. And not only in New York City and cities, but we're looking for basements, garages, and even the back of restaurants. So uh, the Pest X, it operates at ultrasonic frequencies, as you mentioned before. Those are frequencies beyond about 20 kilohertz, so that's above human hearing. But uh, other animals and species, they all have different hearing ranges. So wherever it's operating, it's going to be in audible communities. Uh, it'll generally operate in the 20 kilohertz to 80 kilohertz range with an ability to adjust. Humans, uh, about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, that varies with age. You know, when you get a little older, normally that, that high frequency range lowers a little bit. Dogs can hear anywhere from 60 to 45 kilohertz. Cats, 50 to 65. Mice, 100 hertz to 100 kilohertz. Very wide range. And rats, 200 hertz to 80 kilohertz. So, another great thing about this device is that you're going to use it in areas like garage or a basement where when, if you could hear it, it's not going to bother you because you're not going to be in there often. Also, if you have pets, a cat or dog, you can have the device operating at a frequency that is beyond their hearing capabilities. And also, it's not going to travel through the walls. It's only going to be effective in that room that you're using. Uh, as Jim mentioned, there is the continuous transmission mode. And uh, that's going to stay on all the time. You're going to control the frequency manually using a potentiometer. The signal is created using a 555 timer circuit. I'll get into that a little bit more later. That output signal is fed to a micro buzzer, which puts the sound out. Uh, frequency is controlled by the potentiometer on the outside of the prototype. I'll show you that. And having the ability to vary the frequency is what implements the unpredictability of the device. Now, when you're dealing with insects, it's a little bit easier because you can leave it on one frequency and it's going to be effective. When you're dealing with mice or rats or anything with just a tiny brain, they can become accustomed to a certain frequency. And over time, it will become ineffective. OK. so. The sensor activated mode, this would be used in a different scenario. Now, if you had it in your garage or basement where there is a void and, or an area that you think that pests are entering, like mice, you can use that over there. This won't be implemented in the base model. The base model will only have the varying frequency continuous transmission mode. So this is a little bit of an upgrade. But when the uh, passive infrared motion sensor is triggered, it will send out a series of ultrasonic pulses. And uh, that's also going to be fed through the active buzzer. They'll have an LED notification and not included in the base SX model. So, as far as power goes, the prototype runs on a 9 volt battery. Once we go into production, we're probably not going to use a 9 volt battery. We're looking more towards uh, 3 AA batteries to be a little bit more efficient. And uh, we're using an Arduino Uno microcontroller right now, so that's the reason that we have a 9 volt. Estimate of battery life, continuous mode. With our research, we estimate that, that can last for 36 to 48 hours. If you're strictly using a sensor, you can go up to 30 days. All right, yeah. As I mentioned, the prototype uses an Arduino Uno for the microcontroller. So that is what we put our software in that controls the peripheral devices, the microcontroller. When we go into production, we're going to use something a little bit cheaper and smaller. So for our base model, we're not going to have too many inputs and outputs, and it's going to need very little code. So we're considering a microchip AT Tiny. And the operational voltage for that is going to be anywhere from 2.7 volts to 5.5 volts, which is why we're able to also step down the power maybe use two or three AA batteries. Uh, Eight-bit microcontroller, two kilobytes of program memory, and software is going to be C-based. Here's a little bit of the uh, Arduino code that we put in. 
I won't get too far into that, but obviously we have eight inputs and outputs, different variables, and this is what makes the device function. When we go into production, we're going to have uh, a micro chip, micro low dropout voltage regulator. That's going to make everything more compatible. And uh, some other components that we use are a TDK buzzer, various resistors and capacitors, a couple of LEDs, and a potentiometer. Alright, this is our prototype circuit schematic. This is the Arduino Uno. This is the uh, output DCC. So that outputs 5 volts from the microcontroller that can be hooked up to any other device. This is the ground. These are the digital inputs and outputs, 1 through 8, that we're using. Now you can see here, this is the continuous mode power switch hooked up to input 1. Sensor mode power switch hooked up to input 2. These both implement a type of pull-down resistor so that the microcontroller can distinguish between a low and a high state. So that's better for the switching mechanism and you won't have any real issues with that. They're both hooked up to VCC so that the microcontroller will read when it's high, which will control the power of the 555 timer circuit, or the power that will turn on the passive infrared sensor. The 555 timer circuit, uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly what we use inside of that because we have to keep a few things secret. <laughs> uh, being fed to the buzzer. You've got your PIR sensor here, getting powered by pin 4, the output of the PIR sensor, another input to the Arduino, that will control another output fed to a passive buzzer, and that is what emits the series of electronic pulses. There are also two LEDs to, to let you know if you're in automatic mode or sensor mode. Now, I'm going to get into a little demonstration here, but first, I want to level set with you and give you a little background on how our product works. Can I write this? Yeah, of course. in nature, whether it's mechanical, electromagnetic, sound, pressure, they travel in sinusoidal waves. At a given frequency and a given amplitude, which is similar to the magnitude. So, it looks something like that. And they will have a certain period, which is the time that the wave will take to complete one cycle at a given wavelength, which is the distance from start to finish. And basically, how our 555 timer circuit works is it outputs a synthetic natural signal with a varying frequency that is actually a square wave. A square wave that goes from 0 to 5 volts. With respect to the buzzer, you, you can't tell the difference. Because uh, when you're in the low frequency range, you'll hear it when I go to demo it. And then when you get out above 20 kilohertz, it's going to be gone. And I'm also going to use the oscilloscope to show you. so that you can see the knobs and the switches, toggle switches. It's a neat device, and I think it's very cost-effective also. I think it's done extremely cost-effective. You've got single pole switches there, you've got the controller and the knob. Five-by-five timer. Arduino versus microchip. Oh, we don't block. Can we just not block the camera, please? Sean. 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 Sean.
Okay, so I just I just fed power to the uh, passive infrared sensor. So that there was the uh, was the frequency pulses going to the sensor. It's a little touchy, so normally it'll trigger when I'm not even doing anything. And it's not really agreeing with me right now. Uh, everything is, we have the Arduino Uno right in the bottom, and we have a prototype expansion shield on top, and we don't have surface mount components right now. We're using everything on a grid board with jumper cables, so it's a little messy, and I think that something was not used, and that's why I couldn't get the uh, varying frequency to work. power the uh, automatic transmission mode, you'll see. Right now it's an audible frequency. And then as I increase the uh, the value on the transmitter, that's interacting with the 555 timer circuit. And eventually that will bring it above 20 kilohertz and above the human hearing range. And right there, that's pretty sensitive frequency for us. Hearing test. We don't want it to be too loud. We're kind of working with the, the decibel output. It's, it's kind of annoying. But like right there, for me, that dropped off. I can't hear anything. Like, like you're you're what, what is that? Yeah. You can hear it. I don't think I hear it. Huh? No. <laughs> you don't hear it at all? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I just have a ring in my hand. <laughs> but yeah, like for the prototype, the frequency, frequency range right now is about 6 kilohertz to 80 kilohertz. In production, it wouldn't have it right now.
Alright, so right now I, I actually put this on the wall. So you can see the uh, kind of the So right now that, that's a square wave that's going to be zero to black and five volts. So it's going to be about 17 volts. So the uh, initial selling price for the base model without the passive infrared sensor would be $19.95. Now, when we're going into mass production, it's going to be significantly cheaper to make it. So we're going to we're going to have a little bit of profit. Uh, there won't build, be the Arduino. Yeah. So the bill of materials, including the component unit price and the price per 100 units, and the description of the components, will be available on the request. Batteries would not be included. Initial production would take, pla take place at our headquarters in Newark, New Jersey, and future manufacturing will occur out of state. So our uh, our, distri our distribution plan is we want to we want to sell our product at several stores like Home Depot, Lowe's, and Walmart, where it's it's available to anybody that has the need or the interest. But we do plan to partner with several pest control companies throughout the states and, and overseas if possible, such as Terminix, Orkin, Western. They're all pretty well-known pest control companies because people that have rodent issues, any kind of real pest issues, they're always looking for a chemical-free replacement for, for the pesticides. You know, not everyone Wants, wants to put that stuff in their home, and they don't necessarily want to kill the pests either. They just don't want them in their house. And we also plan to develop contracts with commercial buildings and restaurants throughout New York City, as well as apartment complexes, so that would be a, a partnership. With the investments, further testing and research will be done once the investment is received, uh, mostly for battery life improvement further testing on the effective range of frequencies that we can use, and the uh, sensor proximity testing and troubleshooting, because that thing has a mind of its own. We're probably going to use a different one. And uh, another benefit <laughs> of it is it's substance-free pest control. It's one, step, it's one step closer to a cleaner earth. It deters pests. It doesn't kill them. And it possibly deters humans. <laughs> and that's Alex in the mirror there. So we're looking at that. Here's a couple pictures from our journey uh, starting the beginning of the semester. Here's Jim working on the uh, research PowerPoint, doing a little bit of soldering on our prototype. We did some collaborating with a few other groups. And uh, this, is a, <coughs> this is actually an MET student, Justin Webb, who helped us, an AutoCAD inventor, to come up with our prototype housing. So remember, we're not only investing in our product, we are investing in our team, our mission, and a brighter future. And another motto that we like is uh, be competent, be compassionate, advance technology today for a better tomorrow. All right, so we want to give a shout out to, obviously, Professor Cartano. He's been with us since day one for the past two years and uh, nonstop leadership, advice, and guidance. Professor Balaki, because I think he went off to go answer his phone call. But uh, he gave us a lot of advice with our prototype. 
Uh, Professor Stone, we had him for communications class, and that's kind of how we understood a little bit of this. Professor Austin Winnick, he couldn't be here today. Professor Fuentes, Justin Webb, he's not here, but that's, that's the guy that helped us with our prototype. Eric, Eric Peterson, 3D printed our prototype. Jane, Jane Kingsland is a, a research librarian who gave us access to the different databases that we needed to, to gather our, our research data. The president's not here. Professor McCoach, Professor Roscoff, Professor Berg, Professor Shuck, all other esteemed guest investors, engineers, tech gurus. So now we'll do our uh, Q&A. But note, several product details are available on request. But you need to meet one on one with me and sign a non disclosure agreement. <laughs> so that's going to go for the detailed schematic diagrams, component information, the bill of materials, and uh, other testing. Fantastic. Big round of applause for City Wide Environmental Solutions. Have a seat, Jim. Have a seat, Jim. Fantastic. I think, I think that was, once again, very, very impressive. I think where these guys come from is really from environmental pollution health standpoint. For all we know, mortality at LA, mortality at New York City has gone down four or five years because of all the pollution. All right. First question is asking myself, can you describe a little bit about its operating modes, reactive from a sensing standpoint, or preventative, or both? Okay. You want to take this one? Yeah. Both. Okay. Right. I mean, if, if you notice the rodents occupying an area, turn it on manual mode and let it run all the time. If you, you think they're there, you see droppings in a basement, and you know they're there but you don't see them, turn on the sensor. Because that way, when they do show up, it'll be activated. Good. X. Investor Kyle. Uh, did you think about maybe if it would affect people with hearing aids, or hearing aids rather, anything like that? Good question. Uh, we looked into it a little bit, and we know that there could be an issue with them, the hearing aid picking up noise. The only thing that we could say is it shouldn't affect them because where it's being used, hopefully they're not going to be hanging out in there. And it's not going to go in and around big objects and, or leave, uh, leave the designated area. Question? Uh, Andrea, Andrea. Yeah. Different modes. It does, yeah. It, it depends on the mode, and uh, were you, are you kind of referring to if it was out in the open, yeah, say like an open field? No. Yeah, they wouldn't have that. Yeah. that. Okay, though, because you you just want them out of your house. I mean, let, let them go to a neighbor's house. That's 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 kind of the basis, really. <laughs> that's the second project. Selling the unit. Selling the. Uh, off your property. <laughs> we we should have brought some rats. Yeah, I mean. right. <laughs> uh, we'll go. Uh, Investor McHugh. Investor McHugh. Uh, what would be the range? In which, what would be the range in which it would be noticed by the sensor? Okay. That's well, the sensor does have variable sensitivity, and this one in particular. It was like a yard to four yards. It's, it's, it, it, it's probably you can adjust more. it, though. It's probably even more. Like right now, it's set, it can detect change probably up to six to eight feet away. And uh, maximum, I'd say it can probably sense anything half this room just from being in the corner. It's very effective. One, and, uh, investor point, yes. I, I Two questions. One is the, the proximity sensor is similar to the types on some of the spotlights and stuff? It's very so similar. In the infrared, yes. right? Yeah, so yes. it kind of works on that. The other thing, too, have you guys considered using rechargeable batteries? I mean, the idea of disposing the battery after uh, a couple of days, I just thought, would you still get I know that's right. one of the long term. We flirted with the idea. Or yes. flirted with the idea. <laughs> and we have not eliminated it. So we, we could even put on like um, six inch by three inch by three inch and let it run if it because sometimes they don't take up that much space. You could then it could run, you know, for months. It's almost like the Internet of Things of Best X, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Randolph. 
Yeah, I got like a few questions. Um, sure. For stuff like like big city environments and stuff that like uh, have to deal with like roaches and rats and pigeons, would you guys like consider making like a bigger, larger model that would like more effectively deal with those uh, widespread types of uh, pests? I think that's a great idea. I would love to look into it. Starting off right now, we're just kind of starting off from the bottom with a small centralized area solution. But yeah, I think that that could be potentially effective and it's something that we would consider. Going back to that larger model and also a little bit on the smaller scale model, like as Professor Puente said, like the, the battery life is just going to eat it on this thing if you have a continuous mode all the time. Mm -hmm. Would you consider making like a, a sort of like plug into the wall, a DC output type yes. of device? Sure. Yes, sure. we're, we're going to have a model that you can that will be accessible, but we still want to have the option of being portable where you can just put it under a shelf somewhere in the corner of of a garage or somewhere where it doesn't have outlet access to an outlet unless you ran an extension cord and everything. I mean, so. there's a lot of possibilities. You could have a big battery with two of these things, each one putting out a different frequency. And then my uh, final question is, is for a consumer point of view, like when they have like all these different pests across the country that with all these different species need to be identified, will you consider putting a handbook in with the product box proper? to give the consumer like the recommended range yes. of frequencies. Yes, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because that's an excellent point. Uh, the production model is going to have not just, a, not just a knob for the user to interact with and choose the frequency, but it's going to be designated switching through the rotation with a, a manual that tells you where you need to set it uh, for each problem. <laughs> Tell the user if the uh, if they've seen it if the machine has seen them in the passive mode, seen any a rodent. In other words, I set my basement three weeks later. I come back. I don't know if it's done anything. Okay, uh, we thought about that. Right now, we don't have any immediate plans for it, but we do want to have some type of uh, storage and possibly image image recognition that, that they could check on. That would be the high end model with with memory. Yeah, that wouldn't be for twenty dollars. Guys, plan to somehow connect multiple devices so that when the motion scanner goes off on one of them, the sound will go off on all the devices. Say if you're going to use it on a 10 acre farm. It's, it's a possibility. That, 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 that would be a good idea and we'd have to have them uh, trigger each other somehow. Connect them all to With a kind of We'd have to have a transmitter and a receiver. It's, so, it's definitely possible. That's definitely an option. Yeah. Yep. I also have a question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Department of Health, partnering, partnering with Department of Health, sanitation, stuff like that, based on the gentleman's comment, success metrics, repeat buyer success metrics, deploying mm -hmm. more of the best X stuff. How would you partner? How would, how would you measure success from a DOH? And, uh, well, speak, speak to success metrics. We're hoping that starting off, we're going to get our company is going to be spread around through word of mouth and really we're hoping to win over investors and customers by you know it's, it's a natural chemical free replacement for pest control and I think that's something that we all need to move for, move towards in the future. Right. Well, when I say success metrics, how do you measure dead pests? How would you monitor that? Would you just inspect the area or partner with um, or, or, or we, Bix, we, we could coordinate with the Department of Health, say, for example, yeah. with uh, restaurants and apartment complexes. Mm -hmm. If one year they found these animals there, and then the next year we employ this right. and, they, and they were gone, we would know it worked. Fantastic. So research study. Fantastic. I, I would say one failure would be if the rodent is sitting on the box while it's acting. <laughs> <laughs> not successful. That's right. Uh, yeah. Success. <laughs> don't, put <that> in. <laughs> yeah, don't put that in there. Yeah. If someone goes to Home Depot and brings their pest well, there. Well, then comes re redesign. Yeah. <laughs> redesign. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, success metrics. Uh, yeah. Case study. Re the research study will really make this sell like hotcakes, especially if before and after, after one year, it's, it's much more quote unquote I, best free. I, yeah. I like the idea that you guys went with the microprocessor because you can evolve. I mean, all these ideas are great. If you had just discrete circuits, it's, it's a total, you can just reprogram and, and make it smarter mm -hmm. because of the fact that you're, you're using the microprocessor. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, Andre? Is the box waterproof? Because if, you know, it's a basement and flood, um, I'm 
uh, this one's not. Uh, we are. It's something that we need to consider, but at the same time, we need to have a. We need to have some kind of heat sink in there, but we're thinking strictly just a ventilation on top. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got investor and CCM EEP alumni, Bill Boardman. How do you protect your buzzer? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, the, the penetration through any, any object isn't going to be that great uh, with any of the frequencies that we're using. So you're just going to have to be very selective about where you place it. And it's probably not going to be so much inside of dumpsters, per se. But, uh, you know, you could, you could put it off the ground. You can have it on a shelf somewhere. You mean to trigger the sensor? Well, if you're using the base model without the sensor, mm. even. I have a question. Can you educate us about whether a frequency sweep versus sustained frequency to annoy the pest is more Something. effective or not? Go ahead. Uh, um, we have read that certain pests, like I think rats go up to 60 kilohertz, mice 75 kilohertz on the slide, and they do get used to certain frequencies. So we would have to change the frequency. Oh, it, periodically. Were you asking the reasoning that's, that's, for the pulses? Uh, you guys are answering. There's many ways yeah. to answer it. One is, can they get used to the yes. frequency? Yes, yes. The answer is yes. Random yes. Yeah. So we, we have, have to vary the frequency. There have been attempts on on an ultrasonic uh, pest propelling device before, and the main issue is is that it's not going to work on anything that is smart enough to get used to the frequencies that are being put out. If you have somewhere in the code that it can vary frequencies and keep them on their toes, so to say, it, it can remain effective. I was just being careful because when you did your demo, it was interfering with the frequency of the speaker over there, which kind of caught my attention. So I'm just thinking, uh, would this interfere with other devices like phones or routers, things of that nature? And would that affect how those like, work on the network? It could. It could. But your phone's not going to be working on this frequency range. Right, yeah. That's right. Don't use it in the conference room or anything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Hey, Brad, we're going to avoid the device. Put it attached there. That's a real life situation. If, if it got mad, I, I think it could. They have pretty sharp teeth. They would rather just destroy than escape, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Happen. Further research might tell us if that would happen or not. I'm predicting that it won't. I don't think they're that smart. But we'll, we'll make it out of titanium. Right? <laughs> you might, or you can partner with a robotic arm, right? <laughs> I mean, it could shoot a laser. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh oh, there goes the passive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, <what happened. laughs> yeah, that's true. That's kind of going. There goes your mission statement, guys. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, two more questions. It could be um, operational flow, system-wide deployment, partnering. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, it, what is continuous mode? It's just, it's just beaming out. Yes, have you nonstop. Have about pulsing to, to see if that would make any difference? I mean, when I was a kid, I used to listen back to the park bike, and I, I, after a while, I just tuned it out, just like the rats are probably do. Yes. I mean, but maybe pulsing? Might yes. Be, uh, we, we could put a delay in the code. Yeah, we can put a delay in there. We'll, we'll look into that with, okay. when we uh, further our research. Great. We have to partner with the lab mice research company as well. Just to, gonna, mm -hmm. right? I mean, just, just to get every single example of a mouse around. We, we did actually bring it in a pet store and kind of put it next to a tank of mice. and It was kind of cruel, though, so I left. <laughs> <laughs> Investor McHugh, engineer McHugh. Yeah. So, um, from my understanding, Higher frequencies take more power to emit. And uh, what would your solution be as to uh, just running it at the high frequency if you have something like rats? What I would say is, if it's not going to be an issue, if you're not going to have pets in the immediate area, set it to the lowest frequency possible. It's going to be effective. So right around 20 kilohertz. We could have... We could have a battery recharger and just plug that in every couple days. It can be rechargeable where you have a micro USB port right in the side to charge up that rechargeable battery. Yeah. Okay.
really getting back to basics. So there is a pest problem in these dense cities with tons of restaurants, and yeah, it could affect business. Yeah. Uh, Investor Bill. Uh, you might have gotten over it. How do you know when to put the battery down if you can't hear it? <laughs> <Then, laughs> <like, laughs> yeah. We're, we're, yeah, we're, we're going to have an, an LED too. Yeah. So when the LED goes out, that, that'll signal it's not working. <laughs> we're, we're, it's always working, though. <laughs> they might need a radio transmitter, but that's fantastic. Yeah, guys, more questions. We can afford probably three more questions, guys. Three more questions. Dig deep, you know, commercial questions, uh, humanitarian questions, viability, mortality. Yeah. Thank you. Manufacturing, how would you produce the cases for this? Uh, we're thinking about, we're weighing our options on that because there are several companies that we can go through. So we're just looking at who's going to do it for the cheapest price. Yeah. And it's not going to, it's obviously not going to be just like this. We have a lot of work to do on that. Okay. But it's going to look more aerodynamic, it's going to be smaller. It would be, yes. Everything will be sealed. Uh, the box would house it. Yeah. There would be no direct hazard, electric-wise. Uh, one final question from me. Can you share your experience doing your field research in New York City before you develop the solution? And we'll wrap up with that. Go ahead. Uh, all I can say, we did look at some sites and looked around, but... We didn't take pictures of like uh, garbage behind restaurants and stuff. That wouldn't have been too smart. So we we did look around. We did see piles all over the place, and that it is a big problem. But we took it easy on the pictures. And we were, I'd say, from Midtown up to the 80s. Kind of disturbing. Yeah. Kind of disturbing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. And and I'm sure down in the village and further down, it's it's, it's worse. Because our, our initial journey was to research the, the accumulation of garbage in the cities that led to the pollution because we're, we're about the environment. So that's where we started from. And then when we, got, when we got into the pests that can spread disease, we shifted towards what can we do about that. Yeah. So like, I go to NJIT and Newark is a total trash pit from driving through there. Uh, you say <laughs> your, your company is based in Newark. Would, would you start there and just kind of expand outwards to... Help bring a reputation, New Jersey. Great Absolutely. Final, great final question. Absolutely, because Newark is our headquarters. So, what better way to, to spread the word than to start in the immediate area, see results, and then branch out to New York City, and then by that time we're going to be selling all over the place. So yeah, good point. So big round of applause for Citywide Environmental yeah. Solutions yeah. for our final minute of Shark Tank. I would like to ask all the engineers, the five companies, to stand in front of the video camera. And as they stand in front of the video camera, I just want to thank the entire audience for being here. First, from a consultancy, from a capstone curriculum program standpoint, many of the professors here were part of their curriculum. So thank you so much for giving the math ability. To all the colleagues and friends who supported them, thank you for helping them out. May you be computer science, may you be mathematician, may you be humanitarian. It's all part of engineering design cycle, so thank you for helping us out. And once again, um, we're really hoping that we continue to do more things for the environment, more things for the community, more things for the world, and hopefully you continue to support engineering. All right? All right. Oh, let me just change the background. How are you doing this? How are you doing this? Engineering, everybody's here. Safe house, Eminem. All right. And give me 10 seconds to get the snapshot myself. And once again, we're going to thank the recent hearing for printing the photos for us. All right.
right. All together, three, two, one, just say engineering. Engineering. Design. One more, one more, guys.